Okay, mute. No. All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the work session for Monday, October 18th. Thank you for those who are at home joining us. And thanks for all of our staff and council members who are here in the room. At this time, we'll call today's meeting to order. Uh, as we look over the agenda, I wanted to ask my colleagues for um, a consideration for adjusting the agenda because we do have two special guests who are joining us. Uh, via Zoom tonight. Our District 5 Prince George's County Councilwoman, Jolene Ivey, will be joining remotely. And also Vice Chair for the Prince George's County Council, Denny Tavares, will also mm -hmm. be joining. Uh, and that is to give us some insights on the newly proposed redistricting map for Prince George's County. Um, and so with that, I'll move it into discussion to talk through the specific updates, but is there a motion to approve the agenda? I'll move. Moved by Council Member Rout. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Council Member Blunt. And in calling for discussion, I propose removing the old business as well as the first two items under new business. Again, want to give time for our county council representatives to talk with us. Are there any other updates the council would be willing to remove at this time to accommodate our special guests? Okay. Thank you, Council Member Blunt. Um, for those in the audience, we're removing item L. Anything else before we go to vote? With that, I'll call for the vote. All in favor, let it be known by the saying of aye. 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 Any nays? The ayes have it. Thank you so much. At this time, we have on here approval of minutes. Um, but I would ask if there's agreement from the council that we push that to next month. I know I just saw the printout of the minutes and would rather that we have time to review them and that way if there's any edits we can bring those back unless there's um, time sensitivity from the staff there. Yeah. Okay. Madam Thank Chair, you. I move to cycle the approval of the minutes until the next council meeting. So moved. Is there a second? No second. Seconded by council member Blunt. Any discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. All in favor, let it be known by the saying of aye. 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 Any nays? The ayes have it. Thank you all so much. At this time, uh, <coughs> under appearances, as I mentioned, we're really honored to have uh, Prince George's County District 5 Council Member Jolene Ivey with us. Please give us just a moment because she is connected via Zoom, I believe. So we want to try to get her up. Uh, so we can hear from her at this time regarding the redistricting. And I do know her time is limited, so hopefully we can um, get her up here pretty quickly. I'm, I'm here. Thank you so much, Madam Mayor. I really appreciate being um, invited to speak tonight. And it's been a um, pretty trying few days for me. Uh, it's been a lot. So, But I did want to um, just touch base a little bit about the redistricting process and the 2021 redistricting commission um, had to do their work remotely, you know, because of COVID. And they, despite the challenges, the, um, the hallmark of the 2021 redistricting commission plan and report has been transparency with a focus on citizen and community participation. Now, I would like to note that those are the words that are in the bill, okay? <laughs> there is a bill, E-115-2021, and it is about the redistricting process. And then it eventually takes us to what has transpired. So um, they, they transmitted, the redistricting commission, they transmitted their plan to the county council on September the 1st. So we've had it in our possession since then. Um, we held a public hearing on the redistricting commission plan in on September 28th, which included public testimony, comment, and plan proposals. So, um, and basically what we all need to keep in mind is that because of COVID, the census data was very late this year. And so there wasn't um, the usual amount of time to work on redistricting. And as a result of that, the plan of the redistricting commission had been, they call a least, least change map. So since they didn't have time to put it together, they said, 
let us look at the existing lines. They seem to be working fine. Uh, we'll just make little changes on the edges on the districts that need to be um, made a little larger or a little smaller based on population. You're trying to get all the population with, you know, plus or minus five, five points. And, and they did a great job and, you know, nobody's ever 100% happy with these things. But for District 5, it was totally fine because there were no changes. And I think that our district has been... Um, going well as far as how we communicate and and um, other things involved with our work around the district. So I was not planning to propose any changes because I was fine with the commission's plan. And I had not heard a word from any of my colleagues, not a single one, with um, giving us a heads up with, hey, I have a different plan. I have, here's why I have a different plan, nothing until last Thursday when um, we, when I thought what we were gonna do is just go forward, officially vote for the, um, the commission's plan and move on. But it, that is not what happened. And you know, I, you know that we have term limits on the county council and one of the members who is term limited. Um, and so you look at that and say, why do you care what the lines are? But um, in any event, um, we can all speculate. Council Member Davis proposed a completely, wholly different plan, dramatically different at the last minute, and you could barely see it on the screen. It was really hard to be able to see. It's not like they had a printout. We're all working remotely. And the first thing that I noticed was the portions. Now, when they're talking about we made this, this map because we wanted to unite areas, we want to unite municipalities, well, you know, the Port Towns has been united and has been working very closely together, even with sharing police services and such things, depending on each town. And I have been so impressed with the Port Towns. In fact, I was on a meeting not long ago where the discussion was, how can we improve branding for the area? How can we do more um, with different kinds of development? So in any event, and it's been a holistic court towns, it's not just Bladensburg, for example. And I've been really happy to see all of you working together. So I, that's the first thing I noticed. Now that's not the only change. Um, this plan also takes FedEx field and most of the surrounding areas away from District 5, which is disappointing to me because I've been working with the Girl Scouts over there <laughs> about um, a litter plan to take care of when we have games over there at the at FedEx field, if there are activities, people leave, often they end up with trash in their neighborhoods and they were tired of it. So I've worked with the team, I've worked with the Girl Scouts, I've worked with the community over there, and now they just wanna rip part of that off because I guess somebody thinks District 6 should be the one to represent FedEx field. Um, who knows how these things are decided, but I was, very, very upset about um, having Edmonston taken out. And I understood um, that part of the, that the reason for that seemed to be um, Council Member Tavares, who's here tonight, wants to have a majority Latino district. And um, the, the, the lines as they were drawn, it was, it was like 49% Latino anyway, so it wasn't really a huge difference. And um, and, and the other thing is that considering that the census um, had many census tracts in District 2 that were undercounted by like 50%, then you can assume that those tracts probably had a lot more Latinos in it than had been counted. So I don't have a problem with having a, a district that's got strong um, representation from the Latino community. I've certainly been an advocate for the, uh, not just Latino, but for anyone from immigrant background, from anyone who's come here um, trying to become citizens or, you know, they're refugees or whatever their situation, I'm kind of a lefty. I mean, I was one of the sponsors. I was the main sponsor for the House bill that allows driver's license for undocumented citizens. So I'm certainly on that side, but I did not see the point taking Edmonton away from the port towns. That seemed to be something that was done without thought or consideration. 
and um, and certainly with no input from me. Yes. So it, that seems to go against what I told you at the beginning of this when they told us that, you know, the hallmark of the redistricting commission had to do with, um, you know, transparency with a focus on citizen and community uh, participation. So all of that is a sham if this new map is passed. And I really have no patience for, um, for this process as it is unfolded. And I really hope that the citizen outcry, which has been surprisingly loud, I was, I have to say, I didn't think most people cared where their councilmatic district was, but I think that the unfairness of it, and of course, there's, there are people who are already running for office who suddenly wake up and they're not supposed to be in that district. So that's not right. You know, it's not just that the candidate's been running, it's that the candidate has supporters who have been supporting them and suddenly to be told, oh, sorry, we moved the line to your person can't even run. I'm not saying somebody's got to win. I'm saying that we need to allow democracy to take place. So if there's somebody else you'd rather win, go help that person, knock on doors, donate money to that person, whatever you need to do. But to kind of do a quickie in run, unfair, undemocratic process, I'm not for that. I am not. So um, I'm glad to have this opportunity to, to speak to you. Um, if there's someone that you can contact and ask them to please contact their council member, contact the two at large members, Councilman Hawkins and um, Franklin, because the two of them are supposed to look out for the interests of the whole county. And I don't see how this new map does that. What is the point to having at-large council members if they're not um, able to speak out on behalf of the, the needs of the whole county? So that's how I view it. I'm sure they apparently view it differently. Um, if you get an opportunity to watch the, the meeting from last week, it's pretty appalling to see the way that it was conducted and how the, you know, no amendments were entertained at all. I did offer an amendment to bring Edmonston back into District 5. You know, 6-4 vote every single time. You know, the four people who voted against the map and for the amendments were the, me, Danielle Glaros, um, and Tom Dernoga. The others, with the exception of Rodney Streeter, who's been on medical leave, all voted for it. So you have Council Member Tavares. I don't know if she's had any kind of change of heart. I know she, if my email is any indication, I'm sure her email is all blown up as well. Um, so I am interested to listen to her perspective. And I do have something, I'm, I'm keeping an eye on my phone. I've got um, something I have to do that's pretty important at the last, you know, I just gotta be able to leave. So I just wanted to, um, oh, and thank you, Mayor Gant. I mean, I know this is really, you know, really pulled the rug out from under you. Uh, I believe that you and I have been um, allies and strong supporters of each other. And when you're having events, I try to attend, I try to financially support them. You know, I don't see any reason for this change, but I will now stop ranting and let you have your meeting. So thank you so much. Okay, we're just trying to reduce feedback, uh, but Council Member Ivy, thank you very much for taking time to be with us and share your perspectives on the redistricting issue. Uh, we certainly know how busy you are, and like you said, your email's blowing up, your phone is also blowing up, but the fact that you would attend to give us your insights on the matter is certainly most helpful. Um, we do have to make sure that we are presenting both sides of the issues. And so with that in mind, um, I know Council Member Rout and I spoke on Saturday. She contacted um, the Council Chair Hawkins. He had a conflict and so asked Vice Chair Denny Tavares to join us. And so at this time, I'd like to turn the floor over to Vice Chair Tavares. Thank you, Madam Mayor, uh, uh, council members. Uh, I see 
Council Member Lundy, are you able to hear? Yes. And Council Member Jocelyn? Hi, I'm here. Okay, I'm just making sure. Yes, I, yes, I hear you. you. I, I, it just felt like I was, <laughs> the feed was a little slow. Okay, so I, I just wanna say thank you so much for, for everybody for inviting me, allowing uh, us to, you know, at least for, on behalf of the council to come forward before you with uh, a, a different side of the story. Uh, Miss uh, Council Member uh, did adequately represent um, the process that we did undergo. Um, I do just want to make a couple of tweaks to say that in that process, uh, we did highlight what were the core values that we were trying to, to uh, enact in this particular map, which were um, keeping our, our having this map not just be a reflective of having additional small changes, but to also have it be reflective of the 2020 demographic changes, which were, uh, and at least in, in a lot of our community significant, significant enough that we now, the state of Maryland leads as one of the demographic, uh, um, the highest demographic uh, diversity, with the highest um, diversity in the Eastern seaboard in particularly along the South next to New York and Texas. So we're leading that in terms of how diverse we are. And the power base needs to reflect that. We also were speaking to the fact that the municipal, the municipal municipalities needed to remain together as well as we wanted to create continuous lines to make sure that there wasn't any like really funny business or anything. But I wanna also recall that she may may have forgotten, but in the, each and every one of those conversations, I reflected that I was not happy with the current map because for I would say the last three or four decades, we as as Latinos have um, I'm I'm as I'm an Afro Latina, so I represent both Black and Latino, and I want the betterment of both communities. But I would like to say that Latinos themselves have been disenfranchised. In this county, in the, in the county, in the politics, and and that's easily reflected just in the school system. The fact that for the last fifty years we've had kids in the most overcrowded conditions in travel trailers, um, basically going to school in the streets. And I know that you have those issues as well. And I think that that's a reflection of uh, a lack of voice in in the political demographics. In you know, and and so. To me, I feel strongly that we need to have a strong Black and Latino alliance in this county. And um, so to that end, we all, and, and just to, to kind of reiterate, I was in the newspaper with my concerns. I was on the radio, on WAMU, on NPR, uh, Maryland Matters. I wasn't, I wasn't shying away from that concern. Um, to that end, we all had the equal right, opportunity, and access to talk with our consultant and work with him on redrawing alternative maps. And we all did. We all did. And, and that's what I did. I went behind, I spoke with Percy, I said, look, this is what I'd like to see happen. Let's, let's make it where I said, let's do the wildest thing unless I put all my dreams and aspirations in what I would like to see. And the reality is we all did that. And I said, okay, let's look at these maps. Let's see how, re how real it would be to pass a map like A, B, or C. And, and we were having if, and we were having internal conversations about that. And the thing is that we had individuals like Daniel Glaros at the table. We have a core of six votes where we, we have conversations about this. And let's also remember that Edmonston was in District 2 10 years ago. And also let's remember that the reason why Edmonston was taken out 
was in the wee hours of a redistricting session, just like that was had last Thursday, and it was taken out so that a certain person wouldn't run against Will Campos and they had to run against Adrian Harrison. So let's not let's not kid ourselves that this is not normal process in how redistricting happens because it happens every day. And if the shoe were shifted, people would walk forward on that line without a problem. But my thing is that uh, I, we weren't, not everybody was satisfied with the current map. We completed, uh, we, we did have equal access to change the maps. I had, I know I drew some maps. And we all came to a consensus internally where we said, this is kind of like the map we think should be. Okay, this reflects a strong African-American presence given that it is a strong African-American county and a strong Latino presence because this is the second largest. We are over 21% Latinos in the district, in the county, sorry. And that means that one out of every five people is Latino. And, and that's the people who were counted. Imagine how higher the percentage is as Ms. Um, uh, Ivy uh, reflect the same that there were certain jurisdictions where over half of the population was not counting. So there, the likelihood that that percentage is even larger of this county reflects to the fact that we should have a, a seat at the table. And so this map reflects that. And I think that this will, this shouldn't be a zero sum game. This should be how we all lift all boats together, working together to build a stronger Prince George's County. And so to me, um, with all due respect to Ms. Ivy, I think that we wanna be able to build uh, something that is, uh, for the betterment and improvement of the overall county and not just just looking parochially. And that's how I saw this. Um, because I think that this, is, this should be the ultimate goal of this map. Um, with regards to what could happen tomorrow, um, I will be as equally surprised as Ms. Ivy at this point <laughs> with everything that has happened in the last um, 96 hours. So we'll see. Um, but what we, what I do wanna say is that um, the core anchor institutions of this county have had a voice and their voices have been taken into concern um, with regards to what's gonna happen within the 96 hours. And so that's where we are. Um, uh, and again, if you have any questions of me, do let me know, but I feel that at least in my district, you know, for those of you who may not know what I've been able to achieve over the last, years that I've been in office, you know, $10 billion of development, not the putting in construction, nine new schools, two new libraries. And I can tell you that with the same heart that I've helped build all of my district, all across in every single corner, and you could go to the, the heart of um, the mall at Prince George's along Route 1, along Ager Road, uh, West Hyattsville, um, North Brentwood, all around, you will see transformation. And, and you could go to the demolished communities and schools that are in the rubbles and under construction as we speak. Um, change is gonna come. And if change is gonna come to District 2, change is gonna come to Edmondston as well. And they will not be left behind. Um, no one will be left behind because uh, if God willing, I have a say and a vote in the matter, um, we will be bringing everybody along as well. Um, so with that, and, and, and Tracy knows how to reach me and we're probably as 
as politically close as she is to Ms. Ivy, I would say uh, Ms. Tracy, Gann, and I are also very close allies as well. And I do have her best interest at heart, not just from her, her professional side, but also from her side, um, even in her professional capacity when she works, because she does work in my district. So I have had a very close relationship with her as well. And she knows that she can trust me and my word. So, okay. So with that, thank you. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. And if it's okay, just wanted to follow up because one of the things um, that was shared with the community last Thursday was that there's no opportunity for the public to give comments. And I do want to give you an opportunity to speak to that because I understand after watching the meeting that tomorrow there's this is on the agenda where the public can submit written or verbal comments. Following that, the council will meet as a whole and determine which map they're going to approve, and that has to be done by November 30th. So could you just talk through the, that process and make sure I didn't misrepresent that because I don't want the public to feel that they don't have an opportunity to share their concerns either for or against. No, thank you. We do have, um, if you guys, if anyone can submit, you know, the comments, but the reality is that we are very limited in time uh, and very tight in time, given all the things that we've got to work on. Uh, in the district and in the, sorry, in the county with regards to legislation. So the time is, is limited. Um, we have, like you said, till November 30th to do it, but we also have to have a first, second, third reader. We've got to prepare the bill. And so that was the concern um, with regards to making sure the key issue is that tomorrow is the last day to submit legislation in the county. So this is why uh, we would be unable to reopen the process um, to extend the process for consideration of, of future, future iterations of the map. Um, the law reads that we've got to, we, tomorrow is the last day. We could probably submit things like resolutions and, and smaller things that don't necessarily need a full process. But when it comes to legislation, tomorrow is the last day per the charter. So anything that comes in, you can submit. We are hearing your voices now. My recommendation is to try to get it in as soon as possible, but that's kind of where we are right now. Okay, thank you for that. And I want to come back to Council Member Ivy. I believe she uh, had some additional comments. And then Council Member, again, I know your time is limited, so the Council may have a few questions if you don't mind taking those, but I want to turn the floor back to Council Member Ivy first. Thanks, and I'll try to keep my dogs quiet. <laughs> but a um, couple of things. One, I would just like to remind everyone that this even assuming that this map goes into effect, it doesn't start until after the next election. So for the duration of this term, Edmonston will still be in District 5. And um, so I'll continue to represent Edmonston at least until the next election. And, um, and we'll be happy to do so. I'm, I'm hopeful that someone changes course and decides, you know what, this is such a great idea after all. And um, at the moment, there are 10 people voting. There's one, um, Councilman Streeter has been out on medical leave and I don't know exactly when he's coming back. So I don't know um, if he'll be voting or how he would vote. Although I did note that, uh, and I'm, he's not been involved in this at all. I'm not accusing him of anything whatsoever, but uh, his biggest opponent in the last, was taken out of his district in this map. So surprising, isn't it? So I'm sure they would expect him to, um, to support it. I'm not saying that he would. I know that last year he did vote initially for the, you know, the property tax um, plan that Derek Davis, again, had, um, had been promoting, trying to get it on the ballot. And um, 
and Councilman Streeter is the one who who changed course and changed the trajectory of that. So I'm, I'm not sure which way he would vote. I have no idea. Um, I'm a little concerned that Count, that Vice Chair Tavares is saying a couple of things. One, she said six council members discussed this legislation, which would be um, a quorum. And that is against our rules. You, you can't have them get together and discuss uh, legislation and make a decision. That's why we have these rules, right? So I'm disturbed that not only I could tell that it happened, but clearly they were all in on it. No, not together. It didn't happen together. Okay. And I'm also generally, I've been um, concerned about this packing of like as many of anybody into a district as possible. Um, because I think that in, in the end, it dilutes the, the power, right? So if, here is here is Councilwoman Tavares before us right now. She is the vice chair of the Prince George's County Council. She represents District 2. I'm feel like she won in that district before it had as many Latino voters in it as it has today. And I believe that in the next election, I, I know Victor Ramirez is running. He's a former, um, he's the former Senator and delegate from that area. I think he has a very strong chance of winning and considering that he won um, twice for delegate, twice for Senate, and, and in reality, even when he ran for state's attorney, while he may have lost that countywide, he won it in district two. So he has done that not because only Latinos vote for him. He has been bringing people together. And in fact, he supported Councilwoman Tavares. She used to work for him. Uh, he was her strongest supporter when she ran the first time. And it was a very close vote. I think it was six votes different. So I'm sure that his support um, definitely put her over the edge, but I don't see that it makes any sense that now we have to make it even more Latino in District 2. Well, you know what that does? It makes it less Latino in District 5, right? And if I were the kind of person who could say, uh, well, I don't have to worry about those people anymore. I'm not going to vote for them anymore. I mean, who knows who's going to take my seat in the coming years, right? I think that the more legislators who have to be concerned with the Latino um, residents, the better. I don't think it makes sense to take them all and put them into one district. That's something that we don't like in, with them um, for black people either. You don't want them all in one district because then you end up with one person winning that office and never having the opportunity for there to be more than that. So I'm, I'm, uh, I, I'm sorry, can we speak to the data? Can we speak to the data? Because the, the, the thing I, is- I'm not sure that the people here in Bladensburg really want to get into us with a back and forth about the data for district. No, but the thing is that that, that's, that, that is a misrepresentation because it the, the data shows that it, Latinos will be five out of nine districts in the county in strong presence where they would have to be taken into account in the voting block. So it's not less, it's actually- distributed so that they could be more significantly represented throughout the county. So, so I, uh, I take Edmonston away from me. You didn't take Edmonston away because you wanted fewer Latinos. You took Edmonston because you wanted more. So that takes them from someone. You're taking them from me. And I object. And I don't think it's right for the port towns. And I think it's disrespectful to them. It's disrespectful to me. And um, frankly, I think that their council members um, who we serve together with, I, I've been told that they um, I mean, haze me, haze me. We're, we're adults. We're not in college. Like this. Okay. I mean, but here, but, but I'm, I am respect. Respect. it's disrespectful and it has to end. And this kind of. But this is also disrespectful, Jolie. Council member Ivy, Madam Mayor is trying to get the floor. It is about reaping what you sow at the end of the day. Um, tie on to something just so my colleagues and I really understand. When you look at the number of voters that you would lose from the town of Edmonston, do you know what that number of voters looks like? Because um, I was reading the report last night and 
trying to get in on specifically what number are, of voters are we talking about that you would potentially lose if Edmonston is moved out of your district? You have to recognize that was, yeah, that was Denny's uh, proposal, so I'll let her speak to it. No, I, we could get those numbers, but the thing it's a it, it is a very small number, but the the, the reality is that we we've grown over a hundred thousand people. So I mean the it's we've we've grown significantly uh throughout. So we're talking about a sig a you know sorry, a significant number throughout the county. So we could get to that number. So um, our town administrator just looked it up for me. Sorry for the feedback here. Give us a second. And so it looks like the population shift would be about 1,445 people that would potentially move from District 5 over to District 2. Um, traditionally, as you all know, we don't get huge voter turnouts from our communities, which is a shame. But mm. that's why I was just sort of asking, what are the real impacts um, in terms of the voters shifting from one district to the other? So it looks like from that 1,445 um, voters, a lower percentage of that would be you know, potential um, voters for um, District 2 if that change were to occur. Um, but again, I, I do, sorry for the, the the heated debate, but I think it's also good to see the passion behind both sides of the argument because we need to be best informed so that we know how to proceed moving forward. And so I'll just ask, you know, from either of you, are there any final comments that you would like to um, share with us at this time? I'll go with, to you first and then back to Councilmember Tavares. We can't hear you. Okay. okay. Uh, we were uh, just we're asking for any final comments uh, from Council Member Ivy, and then we'll go to Vice Chair Tavares. I really appreciate your time. And what I'm hoping is that there will be enough of an outcry. And I've, my email has been blowing up over this email from three different accounts. Um, texts, phone calls. I mean, I can't keep up <laughs> with the number of people who reached out to me. And I assume that my colleagues are getting at least that many um, emails and, and people reaching out to them. So um, I am strongly against Edmonston being moved out of District 5. And I am confused as to why um, Councilwoman Tavares would want to continue to advocate for that. I also, though, see that College Park, um, the mayor and council did not want the changes that are, would take them all into District 1. And neither does the District 1 council member and neither does the District 3 council member who both voted against it. You know, Tom Dernoga and Danielle Glaros. And what was interesting to watch, Danielle Glaros has been on their team, so to speak, all this time. So if you will do something like this to your friend, what will they do to the rest of us? So I, I'm very concerned that... Um, that this whole process has played out the way it has, it's it's disappointing. And I'm just, um, I'm sorry that it's gone this way. I really thought that it was gonna be a much simpler process. And I thought that we already knew what the map was gonna be because the lease change map was the one that um, had the support of the community, but that doesn't seem to um, be the case for, for the majority of the council. So we'll have to see what happens. Um, again, we went through this before with the property tax um, issue and there was a public outcry and people reached out to their council members. They reached out to the county executive and somehow there, a change was made. So I believe that when, when people feel the heat, then they see the light. And so it is your job as a resident to, to speak up and 
you know, maybe you think it's a great idea. If you support the, the map, um, I think you should let people know that too. Um, I, I can't tell you how to think or how to feel. I'm just telling you how I feel and what I see. So thank you for your time again. And I'm gonna um, give up the floor to Vice Chair Tavares and we'll, um, I, then I gotta run, but thanks so much. Thank you, Council Member Ivy. And just one thing before you have to run, are you at, following tomorrow's meeting able to offer additional amendments? I know the legislation has to be introduced tomorrow, but is yes, that window you can, still open? You can, yes, you can make additional amendments, but I'm the amendments that I was making got shot down so fast. Um, and my only amendment that I was offering for my district was to keep Edmonston in. You know, I wasn't fighting to keep FedEx Field in. I was fighting to keep Edmonston in. And I, um, I mean, if you just watch the meeting, you'll see what I'm up against. I don't see anything that I propose is passing. I think it'll be the same 6-4 vote unless, you know, Rodney Streeter comes and I don't know how he'll vote. But it's been a very, um, you know, frustrating experience. So yes, more amendments can be made. I've heard that there are more on the way it could make the map worse, who knows. But, um, and because they have six votes, then you can expect that unless they hear an outcry from the citizens that it'll, whatever they want will pass. So I'm sorry to have to say that, but it is true, it's politics. Thank you, Council Member Ivy, and I know you have to run shortly, so uh, I'll turn it over to Vice Chair Taveras. Thank you. Um, uh, I really would like to say thank you all to, for this kind of invitation, for me to be able to say uh, these words to you all um, and bring our perspective from the other side. I do want to say that the plan again, meets constitutional and county charter legal requirements, which is critical. The plan ensures that 27 municipalities are uh, single member and uh, are in single member districts. Um, I'm not sure why uh, we should allow only one uh, a municipality to be split in two. Um, it doesn't split cities or towns or communities to the to an extent possible given census tracts. It doesn't. And uh, the plan includes the three changes that were recommended by the, the redistricting commission. And the plan mirrors um, and addresses the county general population growth and the racial and ethnic diversity as a result of 2020. Um, and that includes uh, the, the Latino majority um, council member district. Um, my thing is, I feel that uh, there will be some changes, but again, it will. We will be taking the voice of the of the anchors. Uh, redistricting, we have to recognize, is ultimately a political process. It happens every ten years. There are winners and there are losers. If you're not at the table you're part of the menu. That's just the way of the political dynamic. It happens to us, it, happ um, it happens within us, it happens at every level. If the tables were switched, I'm sure Miss Ivy would be running as far with the flag to say, here I am. I, I, I would, and the thing is that we have we have, uh, again, we saw this when, well, not when Mitai, but we saw this when Edmonston was taken out of, of District 2 prior. We saw this in the past. And so this is why we are, um, that's why Edmonston is no longer part of District 2, frankly. Um, let's remember, again, it's a little bit of the history lesson of Prince George's County. So we just wanna do what is best for the county and not necessarily um, in looking to see how we can move the county forward in, in a larger, and, and also let's just remember also when we're looking even at particular areas that, that 
I know the issue in District 1, but let's look at the leadership and the diversity within that leadership. There's not much diversity there for a, a district, for a county that is 85 or more percent Black and Latino. There's hardly any diversity in that area, in the leadership that are represented. And that's all I'm saying. We need to have diverse uh, leadership at all levels of the county. And I think as a Black and Latino county, we need, we need to be strongly together and have that be represented at every step of, of the process. Thank you so much, Madam Vice Chair. Uh-oh, bear with us one second. Yeah, um, Jolene, you put Jocelyn, but she's one out of seven. Thank you. She's the only one out of seven leaders. It's seven out of seven leaders. It's six white people and, and, and Jocelyn. Not me. No. <laughs> that that comment was directed to the chat um, for those who are viewing via YouTube or Facebook Live um, in reference to District 21 and Delegate Jocelyn Pena Melnick. So just to clarify, <laughs> we have a Jocelyn sitting on the dais right now, and she said, hey, not me. <laughs> so just wanted to clarify, not this Jocelyn. And I love your background, by the other way. Friend, Jocelyn. But again, thank you, Council Members Ivy and Council Member Taveras, for taking time to inform us and our communities and we will look forward to watching you all work the meeting is tomorrow at 10 a.m for all of our residents we encourage you to go um, if you don't know the website just google prince george's county council once you're on the website if you navigate down to calendar and click that up will populate a list of the upcoming meetings where you can find the agenda um, and you i'm thinking it may be too late it's after 3 p.m of course so you may not be able to sign up for oral but you can still submit written emails and as was noted um, in the chat here we recommend you send your remarks to all of the council members so that they all understand um, how you feel about this matter um, and so the time now is 6 20 so we do want to madam mayor are you going to entertain any council member questions absolutely so the time now is 6 20 and we do want to just um, talk through it ourselves in terms of um, reactions from our team here. Uh, and so I'll just go alphabetical order. Council Member Blunt, any reflections or comments? No, OK. Uh, Council Member Lundy. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I also want to say thank you to um, our distinguished um, Honorable Council um, Women Ivy and Councilwoman Tavares for coming on this evening. I did submit um, my email to the full county council um, and not in favor of um, dividing and cutting up the county, especially um, dividing our Port Towns community. And so my remarks have been there. And I just want to um, reach out to Chairman Calvin Hawkins, who unfortunately couldn't be with us this evening, um, that because he is the people's champion, that he would be a champion for us now, and that he would reconsider his vote of yes for this new map, and he would um, vote no for it, and vote yes for the uh, map that was um, submitted by the uh, redistricting committee that was commissioned by the county council. And so those are my remarks. My written remarks have already, already been submitted. Again, thank you for coming this evening. And again, um, Madam Mayor, I yield back. Thank you, Council Member Lundy, for submitting your written uh, remarks regarding the matter and um, for your reflections, reflections just now. I'll turn it over to Council Member Rao and then um, share my perspectives and uh, then go to staff. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I too would like to thank um, Councilwoman uh, Traveris from, for coming um, for uh, Council Member Hawkins. As Madam Mayor shared, I reached out to uh, Council Member Chair Hawkins um, just to hear the other side because I did receive written correspondence from Councilwoman Ivy. Thank you, Councilwoman Ivy, for also attending um, so that we can receive um, a robust update. I do have a few questions I was hoping to ask and get them um, 
which is now either further further exacerbated by uh, the 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 back and forth that went on today. I just want to know the purpose of splitting up the port towns. We talk about municipalities, um, but the port towns is a uh, if you know the history past the last ten years, the town of Bladensburg encompassed the whole port town. And all four of the municipalities were all together. Um, and during my research, the Port Towns made up the whole town of Bladensburg. And so a writ putting the Port Towns with Edmiston, Cottage City, Colmar Matter, and Bladensburg all in one, we have worked very collaboratively with a lot of different issues <coughs> over the last 10 years to include traffic, storm mitigation and drainage, green initiatives, and if I may say, Mayor Gant has been one of the town of Bladensburg's strongest supporters. And so breaking that community up is going to be detrimental to the advancement of all of the port towns as Bladensburg being the lead. And so I, I really want to understand the purpose of splitting up the port towns. We're talking about the purpose of municipalities. Um, why couldn't we swing Edmiston the other way, where all of Edmiston, which is a difference of three voting households as I looked up in the data, why didn't we just put all of Edmiston in District 5 instead of District 2? Like it didn't have to be split that way um, because we do make up a strong community. So I'm really looking for that answer tonight so that I may, but I understand being an Afro-Latina, I understand the purpose. But to me, it sounds more like segregation and not diversity. And so I think that we should champion diversity amongst all of our districts um, because the town of Edmiston looks very close to the town of Bladensburg, 40%, 46% Latino representation. I, did the, I, I see the data. And so I really want to understand tonight what is the purpose of splitting up the port towns? And Council Member Tavares, if, if you want to respond. It, yes, thank you. It's not necessarily an issue of the four towns as much as we were just looking at the numbers. Uh, I don't agree that I don't I don't agree that it is segregation because let's be let's be real. I mean, this, if we look at the south part of the county, we have a whole we have areas that are 80 percent African-American. I mean, 86, 85, 87 percent. I mean, that's. And no one is, nobody's commenting on that, right? So all I'm saying is that we, we too need a power seat at the table, that's all. And, and I do think that I, the map on Thursday is a little bit more diluted and a little bit more reflective of uh, the diversity, of the new diversity that is reflected out of the 22 census. Um, and in terms of, I think a splitting, I don't, I, like I was telling this, Again, yeah, I don't agree. I think that this is even more powerful for you to have. This is why College Park is so powerful because they have not one but two council manics that advocate for them. They've got two, they have Tom and Daniel Daros. Similarly, you would have someone like me or Victor or Yolanda Quintanilla, who's also running, whoever gets elected, and Miss Ivy. You would have more say a greater portion of advocacy county to get you more money. I and and behind the scenes, you're gonna tell me that I haven't given uh, your organization's money. I'm somebody that is. I've been in your corner personally for the last eight years since I was working in Victor's office. You're gonna, I mean, we, I made a call. I mean, I can't reveal everything I've been working on, but in terms of the money we provided you, not only when we're talking about Bladensburg, Port Towns, we have been working together to make sure, um, what is it, Tangle, uh, um, not Tangle, well, what is it with Homegirls, um, on Tanglewood Road? Community forklift. Community forklift. 
Sorry, <laughs> my dog. My dog needs treats. Yeah, give him, give him a treat. Um, to make sure that my the adult organizations, eco farm, eco city farms, get money, and I am somebody that is right there making sure that those organizations get taken care of. So I don't think that, I don't see this as a detriment. I see it as a value add. And, and I would be the first to tell you, I don't, I don't wanna, I don't wanna this to be misinterpreted in any kind of wrong way, but I kind of feel that for a long time, some of our areas in District 47 have not moved us forward as significantly as other areas. And I hope you would beg to agree with me on that. And if I were given the chance, the same thing that I've been able to do in District 2, we would do in other parts as well. And I don't want to be law, I don't want to be left behind out of the District 47 map. I, I may be running for delegates, you know, but I still consider District 47 my family. And I would be the same way I'm advocating for my corner, I want to be advocating for yours. So I don't think, I don't think again, this is not a zero-sum game. This is about lifting all boats. And um I do want to just share, I've spoken to Mayor Gant directly to ask for her feedback because it affects her community. And what I shared with her, it touches on something uh, Vice Chair Tavares just stated. You know, in my view, I see it as a win-win. On the state level, Edmondson is not in District 47. They're in a different district. They have a different senator than we have in 47. They have two different delegates. That does not preclude us from working together whether it's Eco City Farms, whether it's Big Belly Grants. We've still been successful going to the state advocating for the port towns. Borders don't separate Edmonston from Bladensburg, Cottage City, and Comar Manor. And so in looking at the county and what this uh, redistricting map represents, my perspective is I see it as a strength. And again, um, what Council Member Tavares stated is what I said to Mayor Gant. If you have a different council member than we have, now we can advocate your council member on the county council plus district five council member plus we have two at large county council members that's four votes that the port towns now has when we're going to get initiatives so four out of 11 we already have a running start so i see it as an opportunity to get more support for our initiatives and because i've seen the benefit of the fruitful relationships on the county and state level i i see it as an opportunity but I respect the position of Mayor Gant and the council members of Edmonston. And so if they want our support and asking, you know, that the poor towns be amended to um, stay together in District 5, I'm happy to support that. But I feel like in the back of my mind, are we missing having more leverage so that when we go to ask, we have more people helping us than we currently have. Right now we have two at-large members and then our District 5 representative. But if we can get four, again, I, I see that as a strength. But as, as you all see from the chat and from conversations with Mayor Gant, I do respect their position and want to support our sister city. So I'll go to uh, the staff for any reflections uh, before we move on uh, from this agenda item. And again, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Vice Chairman. <laughs> thank you, uh, Madam Mayor and Council Members. It's been very interesting hearing the back and forth and I appreciate the opportunity to comment and I'll just make my remarks extremely brief but I want to go back to the 2000 census and at the time the port towns were only three in number and they had to work very hard I was actively involved at the time as a member of the council from 1999 to 2006 in that redistricting process and both at the state and the councilmatic levels those lines were moving around and were uh, it, it was a active effort by the port towns to stick together and communities don't like to be fragmented and that is the right of communities to say this is what we want is we want to stay together and so when the larger governmental entities are drawing lines and moving a thousand or fourteen hundred people from one side to the other um, often what I 
believed then and still believe is that those communities should have some right of self-determination and to say, we do want to stick together. And I understand what Madam Vice Chair was saying about the benefit of having multiple representatives in split districts, but splitting those districts isn't the preference of the port towns, wasn't then, and I don't believe it is now if, uh, if Mayor Gantz wishes her to be respected and she speaks on behalf of her community. So I will just offer that historical perspective to say um, I think it would be in the county council's interest to move Edmonston back in so that the port towns can act as one to advocate for themselves with a primary legislative support system that they can nurture and work with together. And I'll conclude my comments there. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Town Administrator McGroy. Anything else, Chief or um, Mr. Tonelli? Okay. Um, so, and I know in our case, as was mentioned previously, I think by Council Member Rout, we do share resources across the P, uh, Port Towns, I almost said PT, but Port Towns, uh, <laughs> whether it's on public safety side, um, food resources, I mean, we do have a great relationship, and I frankly feel either way, that will continue but definitely want to support uh, Edmonston because they would be most directly impacted. So with that, uh, we will conclude our discussion. Um, I think it may be best though to just, for the council meeting, the seven o'clock meeting, take up a vote for a letter of support on behalf of Edmonston to remain in the port towns that we can submit. Um, and you know, if, if everyone agrees, we'll move forward respectfully. Um, the next item on the agenda is the road improvement plan. I know Mr. Hall is not able to be with us uh, due to some much needed time off, but Mr. McGrory, if you want to walk us through this. Sorry, this is the road report? Yes. I was just reading the chat ever so briefly. Um, so very quickly, uh, was asked to put this on the agenda and uh, we very promptly got this uh, PowerPoint from Mr. Hall, the Public Works Supervisor. Um, we talked about it and uh, it is roughly in priority order. I asked him, you know, does this batting order of page one, page two, page three reflect the same priority order? His sense was that, that the answer to that is yes. Um, he's on leave this week and otherwise would have been here to present his views himself, but I'm happy to do the best I can. Um, I did ask that we do have some uh, recent costs from the 58th Avenue uh, resurfacing project, but it's hard to compare apples to apples because the asphalt is charged by the ton, um, the curb and gutter is by linear feet, and then there's a square yardage charge as well, so it's really hard to, uh, to come up with the apples to apples comparisons among these things. But Mr. Hall did go out and, uh, and measure not just the linear length of the roadways that you'll see on each of the pages, but then went back and did the widths too. So we now have all the information to do some rough back of the envelope calculations to apply some numbers to those. Um, and then with those numbers in hand, uh, we can go back and reassess how much of the budget we want to put towards this, these projects um, using highway user revenues or whatever other revenue sources the town wishes. So that's all I'll say unless there are council, uh, questions from the council. Uh, thank you, Mr. McGroy. So just briefly, I, I noticed in the budget, so we have about 100 and I think uh, 80,000 in highway user revenues. And um, in looking at some of these damaged streets, for instance, 57th Avenue, it is heavily trafficked. Mainly, I think the damage comes from the bu metro buses that frequent, just because of the bowl that we have. They've got to come in on 57th, around the loop, and back out. Um, so that continues to be a challenge, but there's no way I can see us doing anything with that until school is out. So with some of these other streets, and I noticed you had Decatur Street on here, but it didn't include the cul-de-sac. It is absolutely horrible. There are chunks of the what do you call it, the a top layer of service uh, or surface that are completely missing. So I'd love it if, you know, that could be considered as a priority area. Again, it's mainly the cul-de-sac though, but not this portion of the street that's on the diagram. So I'm sorry, just to clarify, Mayor, if I understood you correctly, you're, what is proposed for Decatur Street is the cul-de-sac. Okay. <coughs> so, so as you can see the white line on there, 
that white line is describing the 122.7 million. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yep. My mistake. Yep. I was looking at the main uh, street there. I, I did have to ask this myself because uh, those are all Decatur Street house numbers, even though it would look like it was some different street mm -hmm. name, but it, it's it a spur. <laughs> yeah, so I apologize for yeah, the confusion no, there. No worries. Um, and I'll take questions from the council, starting with Council Member Route. Thank you so much, Mayor James. Um, so I actually, I'm a resident on 55th Avenue, and uh, last year we were here at this same place. And um, I know that Public Works filled in temporarily um, the issues on 55th Avenue. So what happened on 55th Avenue was that we were getting WSSC work done on Tilden, and that's where the big trucks were coming up and down 55th from Annapolis Road. Um, and then we also on 55th Avenue have a similar issue to 57th <coughs> Avenue where school buses though come. I mean, I can count in the morning, it's like 12 school buses, either private PG County public school buses taking children that have um, disability or IEPs because that's a, um, a stop at their home. Um, and then there is a middle school, there's two middle school stops, one up on Tilden, one down on Spring Road. And then there's elementary school buses. I know because my children ride the elementary school bus. So there's a lot of school bus traffic up and down 55th because they use Annapolis to cut through using 55th. They don't take 56th up, they take 55th up to get hit spring, Tossick, Taylor, and then Tilden. So 55th gets a lot of attention in the mornings. Um, I saw our officers out there this morning doing some um, some, some traffic enforcement and traffic control. I say that to say, what can we do? And I asked this question last year, didn't get a real response. So Marie asked it, what can we do to get partnering funds from our PGCPS Metro bus partners? Because our roads are really being hammered on in addition to WSSC. I mean, the amount of traffic that we are we're being responsible for on a regular basis. Um, I've been a resident on 55th for the last 10 years and it has definitely increased. Um, and then subsequently, I remember Mr. Hall saying that WSSC was going to help us patch some of these on 55th alligator patches because of their big dump trucks that were coming to work on Tilden. So how can we limit or increase the amount of funds that we can get so that we can have a bigger pot to be able to divide and conquer? Yield back. Thank you. And I'm so sorry, Mr. Hawk couldn't be here with us to answer some of these questions because I know he was heavily involved with the, um, the project from the town side as well as code enforcement officer Ryan Hart. They kind of were on the front lines in terms of the interfacing um, Mr. McGroy, for your benefit, so beginning in, I believe, 2018, WSSC came in to do major infrastructure improvements. The majority of the work was along Tilden, but it did have some of those side um, streets. Also in Ward 1, 56th Avenue, um, I think it went over to 54th Place. There were several streets, and we can get you, probably go back in the records and get you the full outline of all the streets that were impacted. For the major roads that were dug up, they came back and repaved all of those. So that's why 56th Avenue looks great. Tilden looks fantastic. Those streets were done. Um, I hadn't been as familiar with 55th Avenue Councilmember Route where you are identifying, but it may be worth just having an inventory, inventory taken of any residual um, streets where there was damage, maybe not directly related to the major pipes that went in, but that were um, residual effects of the work and perhaps we can go back to WSSC and ask for some funding to help cover that there's no harm in asking we realize there's no guarantee but um, I think that that could be a reasonable request you know from the town we're trying to be a good partner we appreciate the new pipes most certainly um, but if they can help you know that would be great 
uh, but council member blunt council member lundy any um other questions regarding the road improvement <coughs> plan okay and um and i do i'm going to come to you next council member lundy i do want to clarify i did i think i said 190 but the dollar amount in here from huis is actually 175k so again if um mr hall could get with our engineer and just get some initial assessments on which makes the high the highest priority target to start um because we don't have a lot of time to start this before winter weather kicks in. So even if we get the planning, the RFP, the council doesn't have to rush. We can take our time and review bids <coughs> and be ready to go once the weather breaks in the spring. I think the residents would be very appreciative of that. Council Member Lundy. So um, thank you, Madam Mayor. So did we also see the um, in this plan the information with respect to the would this would, would the lighting for 57th Avenue be included on there? That's the, my first comment. I think so. That wouldn't be a part of this, correct? Okay. That's a great question. That would be a separate project. So that okay. money came through a grant. Okay. And once our town clerk yep. is that's here, fine. that's a project sure. that's waiting. And for everyone who's watching, what Council Member Lundy is referring to is 57th Avenue. We received funding. I think it was CDBG funding. Uh, to do light improvement along 57th Avenue. We did a neighborhood watch walk through there with Council Member Rao, Chief, some residents, Council Member um, Lundy was with us in route. Um, but noticing how dark it is for pedestrians walking there. So that project, again, it is separate, Council Member Lundy, but okay. still, still in hold until we get our clerk. All right, and Part B is also on the 57th, 58th Avenue, there is also a traffic issue, as you know, with respect to the school buses coming from Bladensburg Elementary Schools there also, and also from Elizabeth Seaton. And with the traffic in the school buses, it's like a major jam. And so there's a lot of traffic on that street as well. So um, was that included? I can't recall in the plan, 57th Avenue. So the you're referring to a traffic issue, not so much the road surface Well, the issue. road, I'm, well, so, pardon me, I'm sorry, road, road surfaces, yes. Okay, so I'm, 58th mm -hmm. Avenue, the money we got previously through um, HUR funding did cover the resurfacing of 58, so that's yeah. been complete. And we learned in going through that from the engineer, the recommendation was not to put the speed humps back because what was tearing up the street coming that way was the metro buses. So not so much when they were going up the speed hump, but it was when they were coming down, all that weight was dropping. Mm -hmm. And so the um, cracks that you see in some of these um, images, mm -hmm. that's what kept occurring. So a few years before this last round, we fixed it and it happened again. And, and it's mainly on the, the right side, if you will, if I'm going down 58, mm -hmm. going toward Emerson, because that's right. the path of the Metro buses. So we got the work done. The mitigation tool that we're waiting to implement is the speed cameras, and the idea was no speed humps, we'll put the camera over there, so that can be used to mitigate speeding. But to your point about traffic, the f it's just a function of the timing. Um, several years ago, the prior council did work with the schools and was successful in modifying the start times. It's not perfect, but it did break up as much um, backup as we used to have. But the reality is we're still trying to get parents in the flow and the buses in the flow of timing, getting in, getting out, um, but do acknowledge those backups are still there. And I know our uh, police department is helpful in trying to manage the traffic control just in an effort to keep people safe, and that will continue. Yeah, so I do see, so when I do, when I'm over there, I do see that the police department is helping the manage as long, as well as the elementary school staff. Right. And sometimes, unfortunately, I don't see the crossing guards there either, so it's like every pedestrian and car for him or herself. <laughs> so, so it, you know. Council well, Member Lundy, do we need another job fair? We help them hire some more crossing guards <laughs> from the neighborhood. Well, you we know, whatever, we, that's what that. I was, that was going to be my next thing. Mm -hmm. Whatever we can do to help, let's do it. Yes. Agree, agree. <laughs> so definitely. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Um, and so at hey, this Jenny. time, uh, Council Member Rout. Yes, I'm sorry. So, Mr. McGorry, um, this is a question directly to you. Can we, just the same way we are going back and we're going to start talking with our WSSC partner, I think it's all fair 
for us to address or go to our metro partner as well as our county partners um, for the county buses. Is that something that we could take on? Um, because there is a high number of bus use traffic mm -hmm. that may be a little a, a little bit much for our streets because it's causing us uh, it's causing a depth of fiscal impact and mr. McGray before you answer just one thought in hearing that question is if we go down that path I think what we would need to do is show the financial implications to be able to say and I, I mean I can try to help get the data but X number of buses enter the town of Bladensburg each day to pick up students and even if we can't get all the routes I feel reasonably comfortable we could get the key stops so we know how many buses are coming in roughly and just try to draw some financial conclusions from that to say on an annual basis we estimate this is the financial impact to the town what if anything can the county do to support us because if we just go with a blanket ask I don't think they're going to respond mm -hmm. I think we have to be very specific like this is how much is hurting the town and Madam Mayor, we could get that data easily by just putting in Ward 1 and Ward 2 addresses and all of the buses, the bus stops will populate. So yes, I mean, but I, can we take this on? Can Public Works take this on? It's, my, it's been my question for about a year. We're, we're not talking about <coughs> metro buses. We're just talking about school buses. Yes. Okay. Don't take the metro buses. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> okay. Mr. McGroy. So I'll just come in, and I've, I've been down this road several times with other jurisdictions. Uh, in my experience, there are owners of roads and there are owners of things that go across roads. And the owners of things that go across roads do not fund road reconstruction unless they are toll roads. And that is a clear mechanism for a toll to pay for the people using the road to, to operate on the road. So in, in our jurisdiction, you know, roads may be owned by the federal government, Ultra Washington Parkway, or the state government. We have one immediately adjacent here, Route 450, et cetera, or the county government, um, or the town government. And so whichever government owns the roads, they're the ones responsible for maintaining the roads sufficient to adapt to the traffic that the roads need to carry. And generally, those ownership of roads mean that the big expensive roads with the most heavy traffic and the heaviest trucks and the heaviest vehicles on them are owned by the feds and then the state and it's sort of trickled down <coughs> from there. And the residential streets that should only have mail trucks and maybe school buses, but um, you know, and passenger vehicles, those are residential streets. So those are owned by towns. So it's very hard to leverage uh, other agencies that use heavy vehicles to pay a premium to also support road reconstruction efforts. So going back to Metrobus, Metrobus is funded to operate public transit at a loss generally. It's heavily publicly subsidized and they're not geared to contribute to the damage done by buses, nor are school systems who are also public entities that are starved for funding and are trying to get uh, funding from outside resources. So that's not to say we couldn't take on this challenge and make a clear-cut proposal, but in my experience, it just doesn't go anywhere. So I, you know, I, I could see the cause and effect, and I spent many years working on uh, a small historic town that had a state highway running through it with lots and lots of truck traffic. And the continued request was, can we get the truck traffic off this historic community because it's literally rattling these old houses. Um, and the answer was, that's what state highways are for, mm. is to move vehicles from one side of the route to the other side of the route. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, that's just my experience. So I defer to the council on how it wants to allocate staff time, but that would not seem likely to be a fruitful effort in my experience. And Mr. Hall may have other comments or other staff. Anything, Mr. Tonelli? Uh, that's pretty accurate because um, when I was on the school board we had you know complaints about you know about the bus traffic coming through our town so I'm like well we're providing a service or picking up your kids you know so 
<clears throat> and we did try to work with the um, routing software. Um, if you call the Board of Ed or if you call any uh, bus transit company, their routing software, they can, they do everything with it. It's live, you know, get all the, de all, all the data possible. They try to work with it so they're not going down like um, one-way streets and, and turning around or something. So, um, but there are some small ask maybe, but it's pretty hard when you're trying to provide a service. And as uh, Councilmember Ralph said, you know, especially with like, you know, um, special needs buses, I guess, the IEP programs, they do have to pick up, they can't do stops, you know. They have to pick up in front of the houses. And that is a valuable service. Um, and also the metro buses are providing a valuable service. I think I was at previous council meetings where people wanted more metro stops, I think. Yeah, they did. So it's, you know, so. <laughs> There's some give and take there. <laughs> I know, so it's. Um, so, so one caveat I would ask, <laughs> If you all are amenable, put in the information together because what we have now, which we didn't have before, is this infrastructure bill coming and funding associated with that. And so it may be an opportunity to ask early and get a little bit of resources at and tying it into um, the infrastructure funding. A loop, is that what you said? Yeah. So. Okay. And then um, it is now 6.54, and I do want to allow people to take a break before the 7 o'clock meeting. So to the council, I wanted to ask if you all are okay. I think most of the items that we haven't gotten to yet are already on the council meeting agenda. So um, if we could adjourn, take a, a quick break, and then get ready to come back at 7. Um, we have a couple of presentations and want to get folks in place so we can start on time for the seven o'clock meeting. <coughs> so um, just want to look around the room. Would that be okay? Council Member Lundy, Council Member Rout, Council Member Blunt? Okay. So again, the remaining items, we will move to the um, council meeting. So with that, I'll call for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Moved by Council Member Lundy. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Council Member Blunt. Any discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. All in favor, let it be known by the saying of aye. 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 Any nays? The ayes have it. Thank you so much. The work session for today is adjourned. <laughs>